I want to start in on what's going to be a multi-week exploration of Git. And in order to do open source, one of the most important tools you have to learn, it doesn't matter if you're doing web development, if you are scripting, if you're writing documentation, if you're doing translation, it doesn't matter what you do, it's almost all done in Git. And because of the popularity of Git and GitHub, you're going to find that if you want to contribute to open source projects, you want to get involved in these big software communities, you're going to have to be really comfortable with using Git. And it, ta it takes time to get there. So Git is often taught as a series of commands that you're supposed to type. And, you know, you're supposed to just like you don't know the command, you just type the command and hope that everything works out OK. And if it blows up, you delete the directory, you reclone it and you try again. And as a result, uh, people feel stuck with it. They feel intimidated by it. They never really learn what, what Git is. They never learn to appreciate it. So I want you to leave this course with a more complete understanding of Git, and I want you to at least feel comfortable using it. I love Git. I uh, use it almost every day, and I have for more than a decade. But I can tell you that when I started using Git, I hated it. I tried everything I could think of to not use it, I tried to use other tools and I avoided learning it and it was painful. So I understand that uh, Git is hard to learn. And I will also tell you that Git is easy to use once you've learned it. So there's a very steep learning curve. There's a lot that you have to learn. And part of the problem is you have to learn quite a bit of it to do anything. So uh, I'm going to focus on the git command line tool. I've got a terminal open here. I'm going to do almost all my work in the terminal. And some people will say to me, Dave, can I use a GUI? Can I use a GUI tool to do this? Totally. You can use whatever tool works for you. So one of the things that I would encourage you to do is not get sucked into certain people's uh, technical religions. If, if a particular operating system or tool or approach works for you, then that's what you should use. Uh, I am going to use the command line. And the reason I use the command line is because it is the most powerful and versatile way of using Git, but it also is probably the most difficult uh, when you're getting started because you don't have buttons to click. You don't have things that you can experiment with visually. So I'll try and do a bit of both visual and command line, but I am going to push you toward a comfort level with the command line because you're going to see lots and lots of people talking about Git commands that you type. Uh, so rather than trying to teach you all of Git at once, I'm going to take a different approach. I've taught Git uh, many, many, many times, and I don't think there is one correct way to do it. So in the past, what I've sometimes done is I try and teach Git up front. I show you everything that you're going to need and people sort of listen and they, you know, they glaze over and yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then when they have to go and do something, they're stuck. So what I've come to in, in uh, the, the recent past is I get people doing things with Git. I know you're going to get stuck and that's okay. What I do is I teach you things. I sort of reveal things bit at a time so that as you are ready for things, you're learning more about it. So what I'll do is each week for quite a few weeks, I'm going to teach you a little bit more of Git. I'm going to take you deeper and deeper and deeper into this tool until you have uh, the full workflow that you need in order to be able to do this. Uh, we're going to go pretty far with it. Uh, and um, when you're doing open source code, you're going to run into situations where you need everything I'm teaching you. It won't take long before somebody tells you that they want you to rebase your branch on some other branch and they want you to squash a bunch of commits and they want you to change your commit messages and all sorts of things are going to come at you and you're going to be like all of a sudden it's not just committing files and pushing. Um, something that's going to be a theme throughout the whole course with me is that it is it is okay for you to not know things. It is okay for you to ask questions. It's okay for you to look for help. What's not okay is if you get stuck and you don't ask for help because then you're never going to get unstuck. So I want you to use our Slack and I want you to use our community. You can come talk to me privately if you're feeling shy, you know, private message me or email me. But I, I would really encourage you to just talk about these things in our Slack channel Talk about it in the community because you're going to find that everybody is struggling with the same things and they're going to need help to do it too. All right, so I'm going to break this 
introduction to GitHub into two pieces, into two different videos. The first video that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and give you a mental model for what Git is. So before I give you a series of commands, I want you to understand why Git is necessary, what it is doing internally, and how its design is, um, how its design influences how we use it. So Git's design is unique among a lot of version control systems. And if you've used other systems like CVS or SVN or Mercurial or whatever, it has some unique aspects to it that you won't find in other tools. Trying to learn it without understanding how the data model works can be tricky because it leaks its data model into its UI a fair bit. So I wanna give you a bit of a picture of what, of what Git is. So at a high level, what is Git? So Git is, first and foremost, you could say that Git is the second world-changing open source project by Linus Torvalds. So he starts off doing the Linux kernel, which you know about. And at a certain point, he needs a tool to manage the Linux kernel and the way that development on the Linux kernel is taking place. So he pauses the Linux kernel. There's quite a story to this if you're interested. Um, he's given talks on it. But suffice it to say, he shuts down the Linux kernel for a little while and says, I'm not going to take any, I'm not going to do any more work or do any more releases until I have a tool that works the way that I want. And so he goes off and he writes Git. And so Git since then is maintained by other people and Git is a much bigger project, but that's where it comes from. It comes from him needing a way to manage how the, the Linux kernel gets developed. So it's a really complex, large open source project. What you have here are developers all over the world and they're working in parallel in every time zone all the time on the same piece of code. So for him, he has a number of considerations that are important to him. One of them is anything that goes into Git, there has to be a guarantee that it's gonna come out again without being altered. So content integrity is really important. We don't want to put something in Git and then have other developers, uh, hackers or governments or something trying to insert backdoors into the Linux kernel. So he wanted to be able to trust that any code that goes in is exactly the same code that comes out again, that you can't fool the system, you can't hack the system. You have to be able to trust what's in Git. As a result, anything you put in Git, you can get back again. So that's a guarantee that I make for you. You're not going to lose your work, even though you may not know how to access it uh, as you get started. Another one is we need to be able to work with independence from each other. So instead of having a central server where um, everybody is working against this sort of hub and spoke <clears throat> design where something is in charge, Git is a distributed version control system. That means that everybody has a complete copy of the entire history of the project on their machine. And what's gonna happen is I can work on a project, you can work on a project and somebody else can work on it. And we don't have to have a network connection we don't have to talk to each other and we don't need permissions. So it's possible for anybody to pick up a piece of code and just start making changes right away, which is super powerful. You don't need to get an account and you don't need to have someone grant you access to do these kinds of things. You can just start working. Another concept that's really important is that forking this idea of taking something and splitting it off forking and then taking something that is split off and merging it back in together again, these are common operations in Git. So we wanna make them really easy to do. Other version control systems make that much more difficult um, and it's quite a task to start new branches and so on. It's really simple to do when you're doing it in Git. Okay, so the final point, this is the one that I wanna spend a bunch of time on right now, is that Git is really a distributed content addressable file system. So I wanna try and show you what I mean by that. If you can wrap your head around this idea of Git as a content addressable file system, it's gonna make so much sense to you as you start working through it. Okay, so here's what I wanna try and do. I am gonna tell you a story and I'm gonna tell you a story with my terminal here and a little bit of code, and I'm gonna show you how I might arrive at Git if I was building a project. So this is a made up scenario. Um, I have different versions of this project. I'm gonna start out with, uh, with version zero. <clears throat> so I want you to imagine that I'm gonna work on a project and currently what my project has in it, it, it has a single file. So here's my file. If I look at what's in this file, uh, it's your, you know, your typical project, hello world. 
And um, I need to iterate on this project quickly, but I'm, I'm pretty nervous. I have a deadline coming up and I'm nervous about losing things. So I, I need to try various things and I wanna be careful that the old versions of my project don't get destroyed. I, I basically, I, I really wanna have backups of everything that I do. So what I decide is that I'm gonna do snapshots of my project at a regular basis. So this idea of a snapshot is exactly what it sounds like. It's like taking a picture with your camera. I wanna take my project and every once in a while, I want to save that version of it and I wanna have access to it uh, later on. So what I decide to do is I decide to make version numbers as this file, as I'm iterating on this file and making changes, I'm, I'm just gonna give each one of those a version number. And you've seen, you've seen this before. So here's what the project looks like after a little bit of time. So what I end up with is I end up with all of these different versions of the file. And this goes on and on and on. And, and you've probably had this before. Uh, you have version one, two, three, you have latest version, you have even later even later version, you have all of these names. And the, and the problem that I'm starting to run into as I do this is it's becoming hard to manage these. Uh, I mean, what are all these files? What is file 13? What is file 15? It, it, you know, for me to, to do anything with these, I would have to, um, I'd have to print it out. I'd have to look at it. Oh yeah, that's what that file is. And I'm starting to lose track of, of what's going on. So I have a bit of a radical idea. I decide, um, I decide to change my project and it looks like this now. So I take the contents of the file and I decide that I'm gonna use the contents of the file as the file name. So that when I look at my directory, I know exactly what, what's inside each one of these different versions of my file. At a glance, I can say, oh yeah, that was that particular version of a file or some other version of a file. And you know, if I, if I print out these, fi these files, hello contains hello. And if I cat hi, cat um, hi contains hi. So the contents of the file and the file name are now the same. And that's really, um, that's kind of interesting. It's also interesting because I've, I've discovered that the way that I was doing it before, so if you um, take a look at what I had in project one, you can see that I had like 20 versions of my file, but now I only have this many versions of my file. It's been reduced quite a bit, because it turns out that I had a lot of duplication. So because I was naming my files, file one, file two, file three, sometimes what I was doing is every night I would uh, take a backup of my file, even if I didn't necessarily change very much, and I would save that. And over time, I would end up with two, three, four different files that all have essentially the same, uh, you know, same information. So moving to, moving to this style, has given me some advantages. It lets me quickly see what I have. <clears throat> it, re it reduces all duplication. So I don't have to worry about, uh, about any, you know, having that problem anymore. But um, things start to go off the rails. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of problems that I have to deal with here. The first thing that I notice is that my main directory where I'm keeping my project, where I'm doing my work, it's getting overwhelming because I have um, the file that I'm currently working on, but then I have all these backup files as well. And so what I really need is I need a way to kind of separate those two things so that my versions can continue to grow, but I can, I can put them off to the side so that they're in another place. So what I decide to do is I reorganize, um, I reorganize my project like, like so. I decide to create a dot backup folder like this. And so what my project ends up looking like now is I've got all my backups. They're named with the file name and they are inside of this backup directory. They're out of the way. So I don't see them all the time. So if I just look at what's in my folder, I just have this current version of my file, the, the file, the, the contents of the file and the file name are the same. Hello, good to see you. That's, that's the current version that I'm working on. 
If I ever need to go back and find one of these other ones, I can, but they're off in this backup directory. And this is really good, except that, um, well, I mean, I think you've already figured out that there's a problem. As my files start to grow and grow and grow, I'm getting uh, larger file names and it's becoming impossible. I like eventually it's not possible for me to use the name of the contents of the file as the name of the file. It worked at the beginning when I only had short file names, but as my file is growing, this is really this is really no good. And I'm going to have to come up with some other kind of solution to this. So what I really need is um, I want to keep the idea that I have here because it's working well. I like the idea of having um, all of my backed up files having some kind of a name which is representative of what's in the file. But using the full file name, um, that isn't going to that isn't going to work anymore. So I go looking for another solution. So one idea that I come up with is instead of using the full contents of the file, what I could do is I could run the contents of the file through a hashing function. So the idea of a hashing function is that I take some arbitrary size files, it, file. It could be 10 bytes, it could be 10 megabytes, it could be 10 gigabytes, it doesn't make any difference. But I have some series of bytes. I want to run that byte sequence through a function. And this is a mathematical function, a mathematical operation, which is going to map those bytes onto a fixed size output. So I want to take a file that is three bytes long or 300 bytes long. And, I, and in both cases, I want to produce a hash. I want to produce something that is going to um, always be the same length, but always be unique for that input. So I want to make it, I want to make sure that if I have a file with a particular input, if I run it through this hashing algorithm, the value that I get out the other side, I want it to always be the same. So this is really, this is an important point. Um, okay, so let's talk about this hashing for a second. So if I were to go, um, if I had the string ABC, so if I echo ABC, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hash that string. I'm gonna run it through a hashing function and I'm gonna get back a hash that looks like this. If I were to change that string to ABCD, you'll see that I get a completely different hash. So this hash, if, if I have the same input, I'm always gonna get the same hash when I run it through again. However, if I do a really long string, if I do this, the length of the string has nothing to do with the length of the, the result that I'm going to get out of the hash. My hashes are always going to be this size right here. So this is, this is kind of perfect because this would actually be a pretty good size for a file name. So what I decide to do is I am going to rework my project. I write a little script to run all of my files through a hashing algorithm to produce these file names. So if we look at uh, project version four, here's what my project looks like right now. So my backup folder has every version of my file that I have ever worked with. My main directory has the version of my file that I'm currently working on. And so this version here, um, this hash, if I were to cat backup and I print this out, I get hello world, uh, hello world like that. If I were to cat that and I, if I were to hash it, whoops, Uh, no such file. What have I done wrong? Oh. You'll see that if I run this 
file back through my hashing algorithm, I get the same hash again. So all of these represent the versions of my files. The contents of my files are still there, but I now am not going to have a problem with the length of the file. There's, there's not gonna be any, any problems there. And actually, another benefit that happens as a result of using this hashing approach is that I can start to work with binary files. So my, my old way of working, where I was using the file contents as the file name, that had a lot of limitations. It was no good for length, but it was also no good for, I mean, I had to really limit myself to ASCII or printable characters. It's not gonna work for me to have like a JPEG file or something like that and use the raw bytes as a file name, but I can easily do that if I wanna use, um, use hashing to make this work. Okay, so I work like this for a, uh, quite a while and everything's going great. But at a certain point, I run into a new problem. So eventually I need a second file. I've, I've got a system that works for one file, but I need to introduce a second file. So up until this point, I've been snapshotting my entire project every time I make a change. And that has resulted in having one of, you know, one of these, um, one of these files. But I need to not only keep track of each file's versions, but I also have to keep track of the relationship between these files. So when I add this second file into my project, I need to keep track of the fact that I now have more than one file in my current snapshot. So every time I update my project, I wanna record the version of each file that was used, and I don't wanna lose anything going forward. So if I add a new file, or even if I remove a file, I wanna have it be clear that this file is new or deleted with respect to the other files. And I also wanna be able to go back to some old version and still have all of the state that goes with that. Like, so I wanna know that file A and file B, uh, file B go together. So I decide to keep doing what I've been doing because it's working well, but I, I now, I shuffle things around a little bit. What I decide to do is I take my backup directory and I move all of my file snapshots, all those backup versions of my files, I put them into a directory that I'm just gonna call files. And then I introduce another directory called trees. So what is a tree? I'll just print this tree out and show you what it looks like. Uh, what have I done wrong? Dot backup trees. So here's what my tree looks like. My tree keeps track of every file that is part of this current snapshot that I'm making right now. So whenever I want to capture what my project looked like right now, so if you look at what's in my, my project, you can see that I have these two files. I have a C file and I have a header file. And so in my tree, I have a simple text file and what it contains is it contains all of the file versions that I currently have. So for example, you can see that file.c is this file right here, 2AAE6, and file.h is A8AC0, whatever, right? So I have recorded that this tree contains two files, and these are the versions of the information that are in those files. So this is fantastic. So I can now modify, I can add, I can remove files, and every time that I want to save a version of my files so that it's obvious what happened in the past, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new file to the, tr the backup trees location. It's gonna record each of the versions of the files, and I'm also gonna record those files into my backup files folder. So I have a snapshot of the files, and I also have a snapshot of the tree. I decide on this idea of a tree because I know that down the road I wanna have directories. So I wanna be able to introduce the idea that I have two files, but maybe I have directories of files and I wanna, I wanna have a, a file that can handle building up trees of files for my project. Okay. So I feel safe at this point. I can keep track of my old versions. Everything is backed up, but 
I have a new issue. So my project's been going really well, but I've started to pair program with a friend. And so she comes over and we work together on my computer and uh, there's two authors instead of just me. Previously, everything was, was my code. I was writing it all, but we're to the point now where what we would really like to be able to do is we would like to keep track of who wrote, who wrote what. So we decide that we need to add some more information here because our backups currently keep track of the file information. So this is the contents of all the versions of all the files that we've had. And they also keep track of the trees and we, and we know the current versions of the files that we're working on. So what we decide to do is we decide that we need to track some more information. And what we really want this time is we want metadata. So in other words, we want data about our snapshots, data about what we just did. So we sit down together and we think, well, what should we keep track of? So we decide we should really keep track of who is making the snapshot. So who is the author here? We should keep track of why we're doing this. So it start, as we've been doing this for a while, we've realized that we're starting to forget why we made certain changes. So we wanna keep a written record of what's going on in our files. We don't wanna put it in the files, but we wanna put it somewhere. We have, this is like a journal that we have to keep track of. Uh, we wanna keep track of what changes we've made. And we wanna also keep track of the date. When did this happen? So this was last week, this was a month ago, whatever. So what we decide to do is we add yet another directory to our backups folder. So here's the current state of our project. We have all of our files are backed up inside of the backup folder. All of our trees are backed up inside the backup trees folder. So we keep track of which files go together. But now we have this new thing that we decide to call commits. And commits is another text file. And we're, our hashing method is working really well, so we decide to keep going with it. And we just hash the contents of this file to uh, show what it looks like. So this file, if I were to print it out, looks like this. We come up with this basic text file format. And what it does is it keeps track of who made the change, when this change was made, why I am making this change. So I was updating a header file to add more includes. And it also keeps track of which tree I am snapshotting. So at this point, all of these three pieces of information are linked together. So we have this idea of a commit. So a commit is this file that says who did it, when did they do it, why did they do it, and which tree of files are we talking about? The tree of files keeps track of, let's just print this out. So if I were to cat the backup trees and D, so the tree keeps track of which files and which versions of those files I'm talking about when I talk about this commit. And each one of these, if I were to cat backup files and this, this is the contents of the file at that point. So I have all this information inside of my dot backup directory. But what's really nice is when I'm working on my project, my, my project looks like this. So I have this, I have this hidden folder. It's there, but I don't really worry about it most of the time. Every once in a while, I go to the trouble of making a commit, making a commit file, making a new tree file, making snapshots of all of my files and putting that all in the dot backup directory. But I don't do it every single time that I'm sitting down to work on the project. Maybe I do it once every couple days or once a week. And so slowly over time, this is, this is gonna grow. But for the most part, I'm able to forget about all that 
and just focus on my files. I'm just working on this code and I can slowly add more files, more directories and so on. So my friend and I work like this for a little while. And one of the things that we notice is that there's some real advantages to what we've done. So for one thing, we now have this interesting timeline of dates. We know that this is how our project is unfolding because all of our commits have date information. We also know who did everything. So it's possible for us to look up information by who, information by date. We can search for information uh, on what changed, etc. So that's been really interesting. However, we've also come up with uh, another realization that has blown us away, and that is that we no longer have to be working at the same computer to do this work. So here is um, here's what the project looks right looks like right now. So we have um, inside of uh, the project here, you can see that a new file has been created. This make file. So this make file got added by my friend. So what she's realized is that she can work on the project on her computer. I can work on the project on my computer. We can both have an exact duplicate copy of everything. But because of the way we name our files, there's never a problem where I'm going to make a file called file one and she's going to make a file called file one and they're going to be confused because our system doesn't think in terms of file names anymore. It thinks in terms of commits, trees and files and the files are based on the content that goes in there. So if we take a look at um, what's sitting in the commits right now, we've got two commits. Let's just take a look at them. So backup commits 61. Whoops. So this is the um, original one that I made and it was from Tuesday, September 17th, and I was updating a header file and it referred to this tree DB6 right here. But the other one is this one right here. So I'm gonna print that one out. So my friend Wendy, she's been working on this on Tuesday, September the 18th, she added a make file and she's referring to this tree right here. Let's have a look at the tree. So I'm gonna cat my backup tree and I'll print this out. So what we have here is we have one, two, three files and each one of these files has a version and the files are inside of the files directory. So if I were to take a look, I can cat backup files and this and there's the make file right there. So this has allowed us to work independent of one another, we can each save our code, make changes, and then we can snapshot everything that we do using this dot backup directory. And we have commits, we have files, and we have trees. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch from this made up story version of what I'm telling you right now. And instead of having a dot backup directory, we're gonna have a .git directory. But the rest of the story that I just told you is gonna be almost identical. So for most of what we're gonna do, we're going to use a tool which is gonna automate all of the things that I just told you about. And it's gonna allow us to keep track of snapshots of everything that we ever do, the entire state of all of the files, the contents of those files, the grouping of those files into trees, and then the commit information that goes on top of that. Who did it? When did they do it? Why did they do it? And what were they changing? Okay, so I'm going to pause there. And I'm going to switch. In the next video, I want to show you doing what we just did here. But I want to do it with Git and try and connect these two things together. Hopefully, this has given you a bit of a mental model of what we mean when we talk about Git. And we'll start building on that to become more technical.